Alright guys, my name is Will. Uh, my speech, I chose to do it on the no smoking policy on campus. Uh, I'm going to start off with a brief introduction on tobacco and the policies enforced on our campus. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit more knowledge on nicotine, the dangers of secondhand smoke, um, this outdoor secondhand smoking study in Georgia, and uh, my proposition uh, I am uh, proposing. And then I'll finish up the conclusion. So uh, I guess you could say my major claim is that um, this no, uh, no smoke policy on campus, I believe that it um, effectively like, hinders the education of our smokers. So I'll we'll get to that later. Let's see, so <clears throat> as you guys may or may not know, tobacco, um, it was here way before colonization. The Indians grew it, they used it for medicinals, um, they used it to smoke, I don't know if you guys are from the peace pipe. Even past that, um, the Europeans brought it over to the Americas, and then even uh, during colonization and expansion, tobacco was a big cash crop. You guys probably know what that is. It was called a brown gold, all right? And it, I believe it was one of the one of the crops that actually developed our country because it was the backbone behind um, pretty much industrialization. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna say that. So um, uh, the majority of schools, especially in Southern California, are uh, enforcing this non-smoking policy. Um, uh, as you guys know, California, the California, sorry, Fullerton College has enforced um, recently the non-smoking policy, and. <clears throat> Uh, I believe the policy goes something like this. I didn't, I didn't write down the entire thing, but it was uh, uh, Cal State, California State University Fullerton is committed to a healthy and productive environment and prohibits smoking. And I'll just stop right there. So, let's see. Um, students who have back to back classes have 10 minutes to get in between classes. And so, as you may know, um, that's not a lot of time because you still have to get to class on time. And so, for smokers, who perhaps want to take a little smoking break in between classes, it means they only have 10 minutes to go completely off campus and come back just in time for their class. Um, say they don't have back-to-back -back classes, they may have enough time to walk a few blocks or drive off campus, but, um, let me see, how can I say this? I'd like to say it is rather inconvenient. How many of you guys drive to the school? How many of you guys use the parking structures? And how, how inconvenient are the parking structures? Especially yeah. finding parking. It's pretty bad, huh? So would you guys drive off campus to go somewhere, maybe grab something to eat, and then come back trying to find a parking spot just before class? It's pretty inconvenient. Yeah, some of you guys may get it, but for the majority, it'd be a little inconvenient. So, which leads smokers to either A, smoke illegally on campus, alleys, behind, uh, behind buildings, and real sketchy spots, or two, they have to suffer withdrawals throughout the day. So, um, let's see. Uh, I think Bulletin's a wonderful college. I think it's very convenient. I think it's very affordable. I think that the people here are nice. I think the campus is beautiful. But, however, um, on their website, they say that uh, Bulletin's goals are to uh, promote human success and strengthen community connections. All right. So, uh, let's see. Uh, going out to nicotine. Nicotine is the uh, product found in tobacco that. Um, is the additive for smoking. Um, let's see. Nicotine actually mimics a brain chemical called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, which secretes the hormones for dopamine. You guys know what dopamine is? Mm -hmm. Dopamine is the hormone that you secrete when you're feeling happy or you're feeling rewarded or nostalgia. Okay? So, um, the problem with this is that, as I said before, it is an additive, and this can lead to addiction. And when uh, when it comes to an addiction, withdrawals, um, not taking like a, uh, a certain amount of it uh, in, a, in a time period, you suffer um, irritability, sleep disruption, uh, increased appetite, craving, um, nausea. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, uh, especially in the workplace, but also through schools, Smokers um, tend to have cigarettes because of anxiety or stress in classrooms. Like they want to take one after class, or they want to take one after they just finished the paper, or say they're not feeling comfortable about their homework. Right? Um, and of course, um, I don't think any businesses condone smoking indoors. Yeah, I think we all can agree on that. I mean, it's a controlled, it's a very small setting, there's no circulation, and you just travel to settle kind of crop dust across the room. So. 
Um, I do agree that the floating college can uh, enforce the smoke free policy with the best intentions. And that secondhand smoke is no myth. Okay, it is true. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's, not, it's a lie. I'm not saying you're not going to get hurt from it. Um, and I believe uh, the statistics were 60% of students are not smokers. And in fact, only approximately 10% are smokers. So of course, it's going to be unfair to the majority to, um, it would be unfair to the majority for them to contract diseases based on uh, life choices that they do not commit to. So, let's see. Um, when it comes to these indoor policies, uh, many of the time, many times they say that um, it's, it, uh, sorry, 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 I'm getting caught up in my words. Uh, they say the best way to counteract this is to it's focused around stepping outside. So, let's see. However, more recently, um, um, institutions have been moving uh, these bans toward the final frontier and sanctuary for these smokers, which are the outdoor, the PC, the no smoking policy uh, outside. So, um, let me see. Now, there's much controversy to the bans and the effects of secondhand smoking, and it is dangerous. I mean, it has undisputed fact. We can all agree that secondhand smoking is dangerous, but it may not be as dangerous as the public make it out, makes it out to be. Now, I'm going to go to my study right now. Um, Georgia University. Um, in November, they published this in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Hygiene. They did the study where they took 23 people who were non-smokers, and they put them in, in a controlled environment for six hours at a time. Bars, open areas, um, uh, uh, open areas of campuses, uh, outdoor restaurants, outdoor settings. Okay, and they would measure measure the cottonine in their mouths. Now, the cottonine is a uh, product that is produced by the uh, cigarette when you exhale. Um, and the thing was, uh, they actually chose specifically days for big events, like a football game or a rally, just so there'd be a lot of people uh, uh, who would, I guess, for lack of a better word, induce you know, cigarette smoking. So. <clears throat> now let's see, the open airs, um, as in open campus, the ones where they had the in, in like a broad area, had neg negligible levels. Bars had, a, bars had a good in, increase. In fact, the levels outside, uh, out, uh, in the campus setting, were 16% increase in cottonine levels. Now, um, even though that was only 16%, the ones in bars and the ones in restaurants were up like 162%. However, that the National Health and Nutrition, Nutritional, um, Nutritional uh, Survey said that these are considered background levels, background levels. Background levels meaning that it is within a somewhat reasonable distance from smokers to not contract as much uh, secondhand smoking as you possibly can. So, once again, I'm saying that you cannot deny the fact that secondhand smoking kills. It still is, in effect, it's still a dangerous uh, process um, that's happening all around the world. All across, uh, all around the world. Um, but I'm not saying that we should lift the ban, but rather we should come to an agreement. Background, background levels are beyond 6.5 feet or two meters from smokers. Um, so I say that if we have specialized gazebos or pavilions set away from uh, areas of campus that uh, have large, a lot of human traffic, like in between wherever that place is with the library, or even like an alley, at least 30, 20 feet away, I believe that that is a reasonable distance away from the majority of students that are passing by, and it is well beyond the background levels of second house. So, um, my conclusion is, if Fullerton continues to promote student success and strengthen connections with the community, um, I believe that they have to attend the needs to all their students, and not just the majority, and then leave the smokers to kind of suffer and, or be very inconvenient um, to go off campus. Um, that's it, yeah, that's about it. Okay, Will, we know the topic area, but it seems like your proposition is shifting around a little bit and it never quite gets focused. At the end of the speech, you were really making a uh, policy proposition that says that we ought to have a designated smoking area on the campus. 
If you want to do something like that, you need to make sure that you phrase it as a claim of fact and then tell us why that uh, claim of fact would be valid. So for instance, you could say uh, a designated smoking area on campus would uh, balance the needs of smokers and non-smokers at Fullerton College, something like that. And that, way, and that would be a, a very explicit statement and that's a, that's a claim of fact the way it's written there. Yeah. Then you have to have the secondary points talking about here are the rights of smokers, how they're being violated. The rights of smokers are being violated in these particular ways. Yeah. Here's the reason why non-smokers have to be protected, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. But this type of protection is unnecessary in order to protect the non-smokers. Therefore, you know, an alternative would work effectively. That's the kind of structure that you need to have. You're kind of meandering around on the subject. You've, you've got ideas here, and I think you've got interesting points to make. So much of it, though, is dependent on hypothetical examples. You don't have the testimony of any of the smokers that have been inconvenienced. You're making an inference from what the percentage of the population of smokers are. I couldn't find a smoker in class when I was trying to do that example. Remember, we had to invent a smoker. Who did we make our smoker? Do you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, you know, so, so we had to kill somebody, and not kill them, but we had to give them cancer. Uh, you know, in our, in our example about uh, enthymemes, you know, because we didn't have any smokers in here. So, so when you're talking about this, and you say it's 10%, well, that would mean that we should have three smokers in here. My guess would be, the percentage might be you know, 10%, but it's probably very, you know, it depends on different places. So for example, we have different departments uh, that where there may be the smoking percentage is higher in some departments than others because of the background that people come from or the work environments that they're gonna operate in or something along those lines. So uh, it, I think you need to show, for instance, that uh, what segment of the public smokes that's a pretty big segment. Uh, it's still, it's a you know, quarter of the population, maybe. And then what percentage of students on the campus smoke? That's a little bit harder to find. You might be able to find some general information about student trends on smoking. The bigger issue is, do you have any examples of somebody who was so inconvenienced that they couldn't go to class or that they uh, dropped out of school because of their nicotine fixation that they could? That would make that part of the argument a lot, bit, a lot stronger. Be, would that be considered um applicable in my speech considering that they're not a it's just an opinion well I, it's an example it would be so example. yeah I, and it has to be a, uh, I, I, you can't randomly ask people on the street that's what no. I'm not sure but for instance if there's somebody who's written about this and we've got an example of somebody who uh, said I you know you know I dropped out because it was just too hard for me to find classes and be able to continue smoking yeah. I mean that's that's an illustration of that point. I don't know that we'd ever find any statistics on it, but you probably could find an example. Again, like I said, this would be one of those things that's hard to do because you're, you're so dependent on hypothetical examples. This imagined student who doesn't have enough time to go off campus to smoke a cigarette, and I'm just thinking, put your classes two hours apart instead of having them back to back, or an hour apart, or you know, whatever the schedule does. Uh, get some nicotine gum <laughs> you know I don't I, I don't know why it's that big a deal that somebody goes without a cigarette for two hours but it's gonna cause them to drop out of school or show up late or have some negative effect which is kind of the claim that you're making I like the the end argument that says that we don't need to have these rules to accommodate these folks that's I think the way you need to go on that okay. all right thank you